All right, this morning uh, I want to talk about the Israel and Palestine conflict. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the whole uh, political side of it because it's a very uh, complex topic. But what I thought I would do today uh, is give you a biblical view, uh, or what I believe is a biblical view, of the Israel and uh, Palestine conflict. So, first of all, just a couple of thoughts on the Israel-Palestine conflict. I think, from, from what I can see, uh, you know, looking at you know, media reports and all that sort of stuff, I mean, this is, a, this is a conflict that has gone on for a very long time. And the conflict is like a, a bit of divorce, you know, where two sides, um, you know, you can think of both sides, the two countries, they're like, they're like the two spouses and they've both committed wrongs against each other, just like both countries have both committed atrocities atrocities against each other and they're constantly at war and one atrocity is justifying another atrocity and um, just like you know with a bit of divorce you know one wrong justifies another or they did this so we're doing that and the conflict continues so really when it comes to contentions when you look at even contentions between countries I see that there's a lot of parallels just between con conflict between people because that's ultimately what it is when two countries go to war these are people going to war and whether the war is on a grand scale at the country level or the war is on a personal level at a marriage or a friendship level um, you see the same sort of things happening where you know people are dragging in people are taking sides uh, wrongs are done on both sides and trying to justify the other but like in a bit of divorce who are the ones that suffer the ones that suffer are the children and just like when countries go to war, who are the ones that suffer? It's the citizens that suffer. You know, uh, there's a saying uh, in, in, in political speak that when countries go to war, you know, poor men die in rich men's wars and really only the elite and the military industrial complex, they're the winners. But both countries, they lose. They lose money, they lose resources, they lose their loved ones. And, 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 and like I said, poor men are sent to die in in rich men's battles, so it's, uh, it's terrible on both sides. And you'll see the media bias exists on both sides, and this is why when you see in the media, you know, people are really upset because, you know, just like when in a bitter divorce, when you try and, you know, uh, say one person should do this, then the other person's like, yeah, well, that person did this. And, and you'll try and say, well, that doesn't justify them doing that. And likewise, on the other side, you say, hey, this is the right thing to do. And they're saying, hey, but they did this. And, and this is what you're seeing in the media, where, you know, you have Piers Morgan. And I see that, you know, when you, if you watch a lot of the Piers Morgan <laughs> uh, interviews, you know, Piers Morgan is always like, do you condemn Hamas, right? And then the, the pro-Palestinians are like, why do you have to start the conversation there? Like, why do you have to start with like, what Palestine was wrong? Why need you talk about what Israel's done wrong? And you see, it's exactly like any other conflict. Why, why are they concentrating on what we're doing wrong when you never say what they're doing wrong? And if you've ever had to deal with conflict, that, that's exactly what it sounds like. And this is what I'm saying, you know, even though it's at a grander scale, it's just unfortunate that these conflicts get up to even to the country level where the fallout is even worse than, you know, just a, a personal relationship falling out. And the, the media is kind of like the, the friends, right? They're trying to count what's going on. They take sides and people don't like what this journalist says, or that journalist says, and the conflict continues. Now, in terms of politically, like, my opinion is no, no matter what side you are on in this conflict, you know, whether you think Israel is more justified or Palestine is more justified, or who's, uh, you know, the balance, uh, who's proportionately more justified, where they're both wrong. No matter what your opinion is in this conflict, politically, as Australians, I think we should all agree that Australia should have nothing to do with this conflict that is on the other side of the world. Because what happens is people get emotionally invested in these conflicts, and then they believe that Australia should send its taxpayer funds and its soldiers to go fight a war in another country. It has nothing to do with Australia. So this is more political philosophy, but you know, that's not what taxpayer funds are for. Taxpayer funds are for you know, defending the interests of Australia and you know, for Australia. Uh, taxpayer funds are not to fight somebody else's war. Now, if somebody wants to support Palestine, or somebody wants to support Israel, they can take of their own pocket, you know, like charity, and take of their own money and donate to causes like people could donate to Ukraine or Russia or whoever they wanted to donate to. But it's another thing to say, 
Australia, which is taxpayer funds, should be used to support one side or another because I don't think taxpayer funds should be uh, used for wars that don't involve Australia. Look at what Proverbs 26, 17 says, and this is the verse that I sometimes think of when I think of all these entangling alliances around the world and countries getting involved in wars that they shouldn't get involved with. This is like you, think about it at the personal level. This is like you being involved in a conflict that has really nothing to do with you and you involve yourself and you get involved in that conflict. The Bible says here in Proverbs 26, 17, he that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. So you say you take an aggressive dog by the ears. It's like you just leave the dog alone, but no, you go and take the dog by the ears and then you end up uh, getting attacked. So I don't believe Australia should be involved in this conflict, but unfortunately they probably will because Australia is America's lapdog. And if America gets involved, Australia might be dragged into the conflict. But, you know, what is the solution for peace? Because when you think about how it's talked about in the media, they talk a lot about proportionate response. And they'll say, surely Hamas knew that when Hamas went and uh, did that attack on October 7th, they knew that Israel would respond. But the question is, should Israel respond? I mean, likewise, even if it was the other way, should they respond? Because what I see talked about in the media is, oh, what is the proportionate response? If Hamas killed, you know, whatever, 1,500 civilians, should then Israel kill 1,500 civilians to make it even? Or is it because now they're defending, should they then kill even more? Is it justified that when they attack, you know, Gaza or when they attack Hamas, that so many civilians get killed because it's a justified response? And to me, that sounds a lot like in a marriage when somebody does something wrong and they say, well, I'm justified in doing this to this person or doing that to that because they did that to me. Now, is that the solution? Is that going to lead to peace? This may be how the world deals with war, but you know, my opinion is I think we could potentially use biblical principles to arrive at peace because I don't think fighting evil with evil will come to peace. Because what's going to happen? They're going to retaliate and then the retaliation is going to have more blowback and more, you know, un, you know, innocent lives being lost and that's going to create more revenge and then, you know, this is like the stuff of movies where, haven't you guys seen those movies where there's just like, it's just like a never-ending conflict because every retaliation, you know, the children of those that get retaliated grow up and they're going to revenge and go back and it's just this never-ending fight until what? until somebody says, you know what, I'm going to forbear, I'm going to call the truce, I'm going to stop and defend, I'm not going to retaliate, even though the world may say it's, think it's justified, will that lead to peace? I don't think so. I think the solution to peace is not fighting evil with evil. Look at Romans 12, 17. It says, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. So you see how sometimes the peaceful solution is that you do not take vengeance for the wrong against you. Because if you do, that may just lead to more vengeance, lead to more vengeance. In the same way, when it comes to personal relationships, it's the same way. Because if you recompense evil for evil, the cycle of evil against each other just con keeps continuing. And like these conflicts in the world. Like I said, it's no different to relationships. So it says here, if, if, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So when it comes to countries, how do I think this may work? And this is just, this is just my opinion. I'm not some army general with uh, you know, all this experience, but I'm just sharing with you my thoughts here. I think if a country does not retaliate offensively, that's the only way it can stop. Because, like I said, if they keep retaliating offensively, it's just going to breed more and more bloodshed and more and more revenge, and it'll just keep going until it just escalates until 
you know, maybe there's no resources left and there's nobody left to die. But if a country says, you know what, we unfortunately allowed this attack, we're going to beef up our defences, I think if they don't retaliate offensively, then, and they just defend themselves, then this fight may come to an end. So let's say a country defends its own borders and it arms its own citizens so that no further attacks can happen, then that can stop. And then there's no innocent lives on the other side being killed. They're just defending their own country. Now you say, well, what if Hamas just keeps attacking, just keeps attacking, just keeps attacking? I just don't think that is possible because it's very, very expensive. War is super expensive. You know, it's like I was, I was saying to Billy, we we're having a conversation, you know, you just, you see in the movies, they're just like firing like these, you know, uh, you know, like Rambo type movies, just like machine gun through the, just like just infinite ammo, you know, you play like those, you know, you play those shooting computer games and there's just like unlimited ammo, you can just like hold the trigger, just like just keep firing. Just, and it, that's not what war is like. I mean, every time you fire those bullets, it's money, missiles is money, and then you're, you're impoverishing your people. Eventually, a country can't sustain a war forever. And if that's the case, then they're just going to impoverish themselves. It's a lot easier to defend a country than it is to attack. So war is expensive. It's not just materials that they're using, but it's life as well. And a country can't sustain an offensive attack indefinitely. So in terms of the conflict, those are my thoughts there. And I think that there may be a solution to peace if they follow biblical principles. But let's talk a bit about just other aspects of this Israel uh, and Palestine conflict. So the first one I want to address is, does Israel have any divine right to the land? So the way I see this conflict, that this is just two countries at war, and the elites have their interests, whatever those interests are, there's all these theories out there, my view is it doesn't matter what these interests are because they're going to fight for their interests like the Bible says in James 4. They have lusts, and they're going to war, and that's why they go to, to fight. But I don't believe that this is some holy war. Now, those involved, like the Arab country, you know, Palestine and Israel, they may think that they're doing God's will. But we're trying to get a biblical perspective on this today. Is this some sort of holy war? And does Israel have some sort of divine right to the land or not? Well, I believe, no, they don't. Now, private property rights is a very complex topic. Um, you know, without some sort of divine decree, you know, where, where do property rights come from? How do you establish who has the rightful ownership of the land? Now, if you believe in a God and you say, well, Israel initially had rights to the land because God gave it to them by divine decree, right? But did they stay in the land? No. So apart from divine decree, which is God actually giving somebody the land, how, does, how do initial private property rights get established? Well, there's a lot of different theories out there and there's a lot of different, you know, uh, different ways people come about this. Um, you know, if you follow a libertarian worldview, which is more my political philosophy, you know, property rights is established by homesteading, right? So homesteading is whoever uses the land first, and then you can defend the land, maybe you build a fence around it, and then there's a lot of negotiation that goes on for people to build alliances, and it's all done through uh, voluntary agreements. But what do you see today? What you see today is, you know, a uh, group of people will build up arms, create a country, they will forcefully take over a place, say this is our you know, domain, and then they have an army to defend it. So a lot of libertarians do not like that method because they see that, that that was private property gained through violence as opposed to voluntary means. Homesteading is nobody was using the land, you use it, and then now you can buy and sell and trade, and then that's how people voluntarily build up these societies as opposed to forcefully through violence. So there are a lot of different ways out there people try and discuss political philosoph philosophy or you know, freedom philosophy of how private property rights are established. Now that aside, now what we do know though, for sure, is that Israel has no divine rights in this land dispute. And this is something that we can talk about as Christians because this is a religious belief, right? 
who is, who is the true Israel? Does Israel has a right, have a right to the land that supposedly God promised them? That's what we're going to talk about today. So does Israel have any divine right to the land? I don't believe they do. Because what we see in the Bible is God brought Israel into the promised land. We know that. When they came out of Egypt, then they were in the wilderness, God brought them into the promised land, drove out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all the Ite, you know, nations, gave them land, didn't drive them out completely, remember, because they were not completely obedient, they didn't drive them out completely, God left some of them in there to prove whether they would be obedient to God. But due to Israel's disobedience, he cast them out of the land. So they lost the right to the land and he scattered them. And we see this in some, some of the chapters, which we'll look in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, where God says this to them. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, look, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again by ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies, for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So there in Deuteronomy they came out of captivity, Says, but if they disobey, they're going to go into captivity again. A lot of people believe that, you know, like the spirit of Egypt and Babylon, like it goes on to different organizations, but uh, different countries or different, uh, what's the word, um, empires. But when Israel was cast out of the land, they were always subject to another empire. They were never their own nation again. Deuteronomy 29, even all nations shall say, wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? So what we're looking at is some of the, the warnings that God gave to Israel to say, if you do not obey God's word, right, which was part of the covenant, the blessing and the cursing, right, they would not only be cursed, but they would be cast out of the land. Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, for they went and served other gods, and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not, and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring, it, bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. So, I, I won't go into all the history, but we, we know when... The, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrian siege. The southern kingdom of Judah, which was the one with the good kings, right? Things like that. David and, uh, oh, sorry, the, after they split, but that's where you had most of the good kings in Judah and then you had the evil kings in Israel. So you had Rehoboam, which was the southern kingdom of Judah, and then it was uh, Joab, I believe, was the captain um, of the northern kingdom of Israel. We saw Israel fell to the Assyrians. And then Judah, remember, was taken captive by the Babylonians. But then they were scattered, they were always subject to another kingdom. And then since then, Israel has not been a nation, and I'll get to the modern day Israel later on in the sermon, but has lived under rule of another kingdom. Even in Jesus' day, who, was, who, who were the physical Jews living under? They were, the physical Jews were living under the Roman Empire. Right? They did not have their own kingdom. So even though in the days of Cyrus the Persian, they went back and rebuilt the temple, they were still subject to the Persian Empire. They were not their own nation. It's just that the, the Persian Empire was maybe a bit more like Australia, where it just sort of allowed 
you know, it was more lenient with different religions to go back and, he, and Cyrus allowed them to rebuild the temple but they did not go back into the land like God has promised them in the Bible. So now what? Let's talk about, well, what about God's promise to Abraham? So my first point was I don't believe Israel has any divine right to the land anymore because they were cast out of the land, right? And we'll get to modern day Israel a bit later. But people will say, well, Israel always has a divine right to the land because God made the covenant with Abraham and promised the land to Abraham and to his people. Well, let's look at the, those promises and see if that's actually the right biblical view of these promises. God's promise to Abraham. So let's look at a few verses first where we just establish the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Genesis 12, 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So that's one verse that they'll use and say, Look, see, God promised the land to Abraham and to his seed. But then they'll say his descendants. I'll get to that in a moment. Genesis 15, 18. Here's this verse. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Genesis 17, 7 and verse 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Genesis 26, 3 to 4 is this same promise reiterated to Isaac. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 28, 13. This is uh, uh, the promise reiterated to Jacob. Uh, and Jacob is where you get the name Israel from because Jacob was renamed Israel. So if you're wondering where the country Israel word comes from, it's because Jacob was renamed to Israel and it's just a country named after Jacob. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Now, before I get into what the New Testament says about this, I just want to make this point. This is why we have to be very careful with any doctrine that is based heavily on Old Testament scriptures. Because remember, how do we understand the Bible? We, we interpret stories in light of statements. So there are stories in the Bible, but we need the statements to interpret the stories because stories can have different meanings. So you need the statements of the Bible to get a, a sort of foundation to look at the story and go, this is the right way to interpret it. Now, in a similar fashion, you need the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament because the New Testament is the additional revelation through Jesus Christ and through his apostles to understand a lot of the sayings in the Old Testament. Remember, when you read the New Testament, sometimes you don't even realize that that Old Testament passage is talking about this New Testament concept. Why? Because it's revealed through Jesus Christ and his apostles and the prophets to explain to us what these Old Testament passages mean. Now, if you start in the Old Testament and your doctrine is fully based on Old Testament passages, you can see how people get doctrine wrong. And there's a lot of false doctrines out there that are similar to this, where it's heavily based on Old Testament scriptures, and then they get things wrong. Work salvation is one of them. Work salvation, if you go to the Old Testament, you're going to read a whole bunch of verses about blessings and cursings. You're going to read a whole bunch of verses about the Old Covenant. You could build a case from the Old Testament alone that salvation is by works. But the reason why we know salvation is not by works is because we have the New Testament to explain to us how these concepts fit together. Likewise, you have, you know, fundamental churches pre preaching that if you don't obey God, 
there is the curse of God, which I don't believe because Jesus took on the curse. And the flip side of that, this is where you get prosperity gospel preaching, where people say, if you're obedient, if you're a believer, then God's going to bless your business, going to bless your land, and because there's the blessing and the cursing. They don't see that there is a real spiritual application to this because nobody kept the old covenant so nobody gets this blessing and cursing we get it by grace so there's a spiritual blessing and cursing there's a, there's a prophetical nature to it so you have to understand this through the new testament now likewise with these promises you know and this is where the, the modern sort of zionist movement comes from where there's all these special privileges and special things for this physical nation of Israel. God's not done with them. God's we've got to pray for Israel. We've got to bless Israel. They've promised Israel the land. It's because they are in using Old Testament scriptures, not in light of the New Testament. And this is why when you look at, you know, go to Bible prophecy, as I've never been into a lot of this Bible prophecy, but the more I look into it, I'm going to show you some of the verses today. It's just, to me, it's just like a lot of hogwash where they just take these Old Testament verses and then they apply them to all these modern day political things and all these things that happen. And then you go back and actually read the Old Testament passage and you think, how did they get this? Surely they are taking a world example, applying it to Old Testament scriptures and not even thinking about what the New Testament says about this. And here's another one. This is one where they say, see, God has promised it to Abraham. And to his descendants, these are the physical children of Abraham, and that's why that land belongs to them. And if you don't believe that land belongs to them, you're going against the will of God. I don't know if they say things like that, but that's the feeling I get. When if you say anything against modern-day Israel and what they believe Israel to be, it's like you're against God's will and you know, you're not doing what God uh, promised to Abraham. Well, let's do some interpretation let's interpret like i said the old testament in light of the new testament look at what it says in galatians 3 i don't know how god, if god can make this any clearer the right way to interpret these promises made to abraham in the old testament galatians 3 16 says now to abraham and his seed were the promises made he saith not and to seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. So when we looked back at these verses, notice it always said that, unto thy seed, I bless thee, unto thy seed. Now maybe you're reading the Old Testament and you're thinking, well, unto the seed, it's his offspring, it's his descendants. But then you read the New Testament and you go, no, the New Testament is actually explaining to us that this is not some accident that the Bible says the promise is made to you and to your seed, singular. Because it was prophetical that that seed that the promise was made to was one man, who is the God-man, which is who? Jesus Christ. So Paul actually makes the point here in Galatians 3 that there's a reason why the prophecy doesn't say seeds, plural. That it says singular seed, because it's talking about Jesus Christ. The promise is being in Jesus Christ, and that's why... When you go later down the chapter in Galatians 3.28, it says there is neither Jew nor Greek. You see, there's no Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, look at this, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So is the promise to these physical descendants of Abraham? Or is the promise to Jesus Christ and those in Christ get that promise because here, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, this is the problem with other Bible translations because look at what it says here in the NIV. And maybe this is why, you know, the, 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 this, this thought is just ingrained in people that the promise is to Abraham and his descendants because this is what the, the new Bible translations say. The NIV says, now, it doesn't, butcher it too bad in Genesis 12. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So if you were going to change the word seed to offspring, I mean, maybe that makes sense because offspring can refer to one person or multiple, right? So same with seed, it can refer to one or multiple. But then in the New Testament, we're told that it's to one person. But look at what it changes in Genesis 15. It's the NIV. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants... 
I give this land. From the wadi of Egypt, that's not even in the King James, but um, to, to the great river, the Euphrates. Genesis 17, I'll show you one more. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and look at this, and your descendants. But see, is this what the Bible says? After you, for, your, for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Now, what's interesting is even in the NIV, so now you lose this link in the NIV, because in the NIV, Galatians 3, look, it, it says the same thing as the King James, right? The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, but then you go back to the promises in the NIV and it says, to your descendants. So you see how now it's, it's, it's lost the meaning there, meaning many people. So it's, saying, it's not saying to seeds, meaning to many people. Whether you go back into the Old Testament in the NIV and it says descendants. And to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Okay, so who is this promise to? Who is the true seed of Israel? Is it the physical descendants of Abraham? Or is it Jesus Christ and the promises to him? Right? So this is why there is always the argument of are these Old Testament passages prophetical? Are they half-fulfilled? whatnot? I am of the persuasion that they are prophetical. That those promises to Abraham were not talking about some physical land. Even though you see the movement of Israel in the Old Testament, it's a shadow of things to come because the true Israel which is believed, is going to be brought back into the land. So, who is the true seed of Abraham? It's Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's very clear in the Bible that the true seed of Abraham uh, and the true, the, true, sorry, the true nation of Israel, which is the seed of Abraham, right, is made up of believers. It is not just people that physically descend from Abraham. Romans 9, 6, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Why are they saying all? Because there are some, pe there are some physical descendants of Abraham that do believe on Jesus Christ. So that's why it's not saying, it's, it's, not, a it's not a disadvantage that if you are a descendant of Abraham, you cannot be of the true nation. So this is why it's not, they're not completely just cut off. They can believe like everyone else, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, become part of that nation. And all uh, uh, of Abraham, and they are all children, and they are all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the, of the flesh, these are not the children of God. You see that there? So the ones that are just the physical children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise accounted for the seed. Who's that? That's, that's Jesus Christ. Let's look at some other verses. I think this is a point that's just made very clearly throughout the New Testament. Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. But as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. So I think this is a distinction that can be made, that you have just Israel, a physical nature, and then you have the Israel of God, which is the, tr the true Israel, um, not the modern day Israel. Look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 talks to this, this uh, true nation which is made up of believing Jews and Gentiles. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So he's saying the Jews are saying, hey, you're the uncircumcised, we're the circumcised. But it's the flesh made with hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So you see how he's saying, hey, prior to you believing on Jesus Christ, you were not part of the nation, you were foreigners, you were aliens of the nation of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So you were foreigners, you know, you were aliens, that's the word for a foreigner, but now you're made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who had made both one, and broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain 
one new man, so making peace. See, this is why there was always this, this spiritual aspect to this. It wasn't that, the, you know, it's this physical nation. There was always this spiritual nation underlying that the Old Testament was a shadow of the truth. And that he might reconcile both under God and one body by the cross, having slain the empty thereby, came and preached peace to you which were far off, to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Look at verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. So you see, you're not an alien anymore of the commonwealth of Israel, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So I, I remember discussing with somebody once saying well he's saying yeah we're one nation but it's not re referred to as israel it's just this other nation that's israel and gentiles but i don't think that's what ephesians 2 is saying ephesians 2 is saying that there that there is this true nation that has the covenants of promise and it's the commonwealth of israel and you gentiles are now fellow citizens with that country so we actually become part of this true israel of god by believing on Jesus Christ and the Jews that actually believe on Jesus Christ are actually part of that nation. That's why in Romans 9 it says, hey, they are not all Israel which are of Israel because the ones who are part of the true Israel of God are the ones that believe on Jesus Christ. Romans 2, 28, look at this. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of man but of god so you see how the true circum circumcision was just a shadow of the true but there's a spiritual circumcision which when you believe on jesus christ you are circumcised and you form part of that nation the physical circumcision was just a picture of that so how do we then get circumcised spiritually well colossians 2 tells us beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So you see how circumcision physically was a picture of getting rid of the, the filth of the flesh, right? So, spiritually, that's right, when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are spiritually circumcised. And that's what Romans 2 is talking about. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Philippians 3, 2. Look at this one. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. For we are the circumcision, which, re which worship God in the spirit. And, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You see how he is writing to the Philippians. Is he writing to Jews here? No, he's writing to Gentiles. And he's saying to Gentiles here, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. You see how it's not about your physical descent, but not about having confidence in the flesh, it's about believing on Jesus Christ. And he distinguishes here between the concision and the circumcision, because what does concision mean? Concision, a ci like an incision, con is like with. So these are people that just have the physical cut. But then he's distinguishing those that are just have, are physically cut, the men of that nation, with those that are actually the circumcision, the true circumcision, circumcision of the heart, those that believe on Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul goes on. I mean, think about the context of this. He's saying, we're the circumcision. We have no confidence in the flesh. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am all, look, circumcised the eighth day. So he talks about the fact that he's physically circumcised. Stock of Israel, tribe, see, Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's got the descendancy. He's got the circumcision. It's touching, he's got the righteousness, touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Look, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You see, so there is no salvation. There is no spiritual benefit. Um... For simply being a descendant of Abraham. 
like Paul is saying here. The only, and, and I think the Bible makes that very clear, even when John the Baptist, preaching to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, look at what he says to them. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Look at this. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So he's saying here that them being physical descendants of Abraham does not help them in their salvation at all. So is there an advantage to being a Jew? Well, there is one advantage to being a Jew. Romans 3 tells us what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So the advantage you had as a physical Jew is that you lived in the nation God was using as a shadow of the New Testament. So you had the prophets. Jesus came to the nation of Israel. That, that was the advantage you had. But then in order for you to be saved, you had to do the same thing as even the Gentile, which is believe on Jesus Christ. It's not just through your descendancy of Abraham that you got a free pass. Now let's just touch on Romans 11. So I'm going to go a bit, bit longer here. Hopefully this is interesting for you. Romans 11. We'll just talk about Romans 11 a bit because this is talking about the, the tree and how it works and the branches being grafted in. I'll explain to you how I believe this works and how you can best understand it. But really, I think what we're seeing here in Romans 11 is just the uh, analogy given of really what is explained in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 said, hey, there's this nation, the true believing Israelites, part of that nation, and then we join when we believe as believers on Jesus Christ, we become part of that commonwealth of Israel. And now he's just using this tree to illustrate a, a different point. Romans 11.1 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So what is he saying here? He's saying, just because you're a Jew, they're not disadvantaged. It's not just that if you're a physical Jew, you have now no chance to be part of the nation of Israel. No, you have the same chance. That's why he hasn't cast away his people. They can believe on Jesus Christ just like Gentiles believe on Jesus Christ. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So this is after Carmel, Right? And uh, Elijah wins that great conf that, that sort of uh, confrontation there. But then he goes into depression into the mountains, saying, hey, I'm the only one that's taking a stand for God. But God says to him, no. Well, what saith the answer of God unto him? Verse 4, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So God is using this example of Elijah to say, no, yes, God, you know, they don't, just because they're physical descendants, get anything. But he's not completely casted them off because they're physical descendants, because if they believe on him, there's a remnant that are not cast off, because even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So why are they a remnant? Is it just because they get some special thing for being a descendant of Abraham? No, it's because they believe on Jesus Christ. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And see, this is why I think people get a bit confused with the Bible. Just like faith can, based on the context, refer to different things. You know, the Bible uses the term Jew and Israel depending on what it's talking about. So obviously here it's making the distinction between physical Israel did not obtain which it seeketh for because it did not keep the covenant, but the election hath obtained it. But in other places it's explaining that the election is the true nation of Israel, like in Ephesians 2. Romans 11, let's go on just in verse 17. This is talking about the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, so this is the casting off, right? Because you have the branches broken off from the nation of Israel, right? They're the unbelieving Jews. And thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive trees. So he's saying through the fall of the 
Jews, the cutting off of the Jewish, the, the Israel branches that do not believe, the Gentile branches can now be grafted on from the wild olive tree onto the, onto the right olive tree, the fatness of the true olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So he's just saying to the Gentiles, don't think of yourself anything special either, because it's not that you on yourself as a branch is anything special. It's because you get grafted into the root and it's Jesus Christ that's holding us all up. So don't boast. So, you know, there, there is the casting off of the, of the nation of Israel, but he's saying don't think that then the Gentiles, you know, anything special either. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. So he's saying, hey, but they think they're better because the reason why they were broken off is because they were grafted in. And he's saying, yeah, that's the case, but that doesn't mean that you're sustaining yourself. You're still sustained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. You see? So it's not that they're anything, Gentiles are anything special. It's just unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So he's saying to the Gentiles, hey, if you do not believe on Jesus Christ and get grafted into that olive tree, you're going to suffer the same fate as an Israel, a physical Israelite that does not believe on Jesus Christ, and that's a branch that's cut off. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. So yes, the severity went on the physical nation of Israel, they were cast off, but on the Gentiles, they were shown grace. But if they don't continue in that grace, what does that mean? They don't believe on Jesus Christ and receive that grace. It says, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, I just want to explain this verse because this verse is often used as a verse to teach that you can lose your salvation. And Obviously, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I think the Bible is very clear that salvation is eternal life and it's everlasting life. So what do I think is happening here? See, I, the, the, the misunderstanding I think that is happening here is that Gentiles just get grafted in and if you don't believe or you believe when you get grafted in and then you can be cut off. So they think that the cutting off is being referred to being cut off of the true olive branch once you're grafted in. But if we understand eternal security, and this is why you have to interpret stories and parables and analogies with statements, is that once you're grafted into that tree, it's everlasting life. You can't be cut off. So then the question is, what is this cutting off referring to if it can't be referring to being cut off the true olive tree? I just think it's referring to being cut off the wild olive tree. So remember the branches, they were on the wild olive tree, if you saw before. Um, where is it? Uh, let's say here, Romans 11. See, look, and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. So you see how you cut off branches from a wild olive tree first, and then graft them in. But I think what he's referring to is if they don't believe, the wild branches are going to get cut off the wild olive tree. And just like in John 15, the branches are going to be cast, they're going to be gathered up, and thrown into the fire. So that's what I believe that cutoff is referring to, as opposed to being cut off of the true root, because you can't be cut off that root once you're grafted in because of eternal security. Uh, where'd I go? Here, cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive, a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So you see how in verse 24, they were cut off of the wild olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness to Jacob. So a lot of people believe that is saying that physical descendants of Israel just get this free pass that one day they will be saved. Now what's never made sense to me about this whole Israel one day is going to be saved is that it's just completely unfair because at this certain point in time, if you're a physical you know, descendant of Abraham, you get saved. Well, what about all the physical descendants of Abraham before that time that don't get saved? 
Um, you know, how can they say all Israel shall be saved when it's only at a certain point in time all the people, all the physical descendants of Abraham that are alive get saved? So this cannot be talking about all Israel shall be saved when the majority of physical Israelites don't believe on Jesus Christ, reject the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're in hell. How are they saved? But if all Israel shall be saved, is talking about the true Israel of God, the olive tree where both Jew and Gentile are grafted in and says, oh, thou shall all Israel shall be saved. That does make sense because all believers are saved if all believers make up this true nation of Israel, the Israel of God. Now let's just talk about one last point. Let's talk about modern day Israel. Modern day Israel. So we've seen here that I don't believe Israel has any divine right to the land because God has cast them out. And the promise to Abraham to have this land was not given to the physical descendants, it was given to Jesus Christ. And those in Jesus Christ will one day fulfill that promise. Um, and the promise is to us, like we saw in Galatians 3. But people will say, you know, the current nation of Israel is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Because I say, how did these people that were scattered for over 2,000 years all of a sudden miraculously come back and form their nation? Surely this is God's doing. And you know, when you look at, if you look at any sort of action that happens in the world, apart from looking at it through the lens of the Bible, I fear for those people that, you know, because you know when the beast and the false prophet come, guess what's going to happen? A lot of miracles are going to happen. And you're going to think, you know, oh, how could this not be of God because of this seemingly supernatural thing that happened? And all of a sudden, you know, they were scattered everywhere, but somehow God moved the, the nations of the world to establish the nation of Israel. And that must be a fulfillment of prophecy. So the modern day Israel was established in 1948 through the UN, this two-state solution. I don't know all the politics behind it, but politics is what created this nation. Now, it may have been a hard thing to do, but the question is, is this the fulfillment of the prophecy in the Bible to say Israel came back in 1948 and this is the fulfillment of the prophecies in Deuteronomy? So this is why we started at Deuteronomy. But no, this is not a fulfillment of prophecy. Why? Because the prophecy is very clear for God to bring them back, that they would turn back to God. Look at Deuteronomy 31. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice. So some people make the argument that, no, God's going to bring them back to the land and then they're going to get right and then they're going to believe on God and, and whatnot. But that's not what Deuteronomy 30 says. Deuteronomy 30 says God brings them back because they see their exile, they see the blessing and the cursing, and then they turn back to God and then God responds to them turning back to him. Then that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. See, doesn't that sound familiar in the New Testament? Being circumcised in the heart. Is that just bringing back physical descendants of Abraham? That sounds like believers are being brought back to the land in a fulfillment of prophecy. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. Thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work in thine hand uh, and God. So we see here, I'll just read verse 10. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So you see there's that condition there. So let me ask you, in 1948, is that what the physical descendants of Abraham did? 
Did they all believe on Jesus Christ and start becoming Bible-believing, God-fearing believers, and then God brought them back into the land? No, the UN just brought a bunch of Christ-rejecting Jews into the land for political reasons, and they create this two-state solution. So this has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. And what is interesting is how then do we turn to the Lord? I didn't have this in my notes, but I was thinking about this when Gershon was reading Deuteronomy 30. Because when we read through Deuteronomy 30, look at what the second part of the chapter talks about. And tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Verse 11, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us? that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea front and bring it unto us that we may hear it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart. Do you know where that is from? Romans 10. Word is nigh thee, even in thy heart, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So do you see the link there between Romans 10 and Deuteronomy 30? He's saying, hey, if you will turn back to God, I will bring you back into the land. How do you turn back to God? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Romans, Paul makes this connection with Deuteronomy 30 and the things that that are said in Deuteronomy 30. So I just think it's very interesting that that link is there. Now let's just look quickly. I know we're running a lot very over time, but... I just want to show you two last passages where people say, you know, this is fulfillment of prophecy. And I just want to show you that this is just not the case. So we already saw in Deuteronomy 30 that for the Jews to be brought back into the land, they had to turn to the Lord. So it's not not talking about the physical nation of Israel, not physical descendants, it's talking about the Israel of God, the the true nation, the believers. Ezekiel 36 is the same. They say this is a promise of them being brought back into the land. But let's read it and see if, if, if that fits the description of modern day Israel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings, Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings I judged them. So we saw that in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. There are other passages. Ezekiel 36 is another one. where God says, through their disobedience he scattered them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name when they, when, when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, for, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. So you see, it's not because of the righteousness of them, or what everything they he's bring them back because of his righteousness. Why? Because how do they turn to the Lord? They believe on Jesus Christ. It's Christ's righteousness that gets them back into the land. And we partake in that going back to the land too, because we get that righteousness too when we believe on Jesus Christ. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So this is one passage I read online that they say, see, he's going to bring them in and then he's going to cleanse them. But that's not what it said in Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 30, it says, only if you keep the commandments, I will bring you back in. Now, I don't even think that's what he's saying here in Ezekiel 36 because when we go further on, Look at verse 26. Does this not sound like salvation to you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. 
Can you say that about the current nation, the modern day nation of Israel? And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So this all makes sense if you think of it as believers being resurrected in their new bodies, Jesus coming and then us going into the promised land, right? Because we are sinless. We're going to keep God's commandments. But does that make sense now to the modern day Israel? No, I will also save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, look at this, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the wastes shall be built. So they try and use Ezekiel 36 to say, oh, God's going to bring them in as these like unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews and then cleanse them later. But then he says here, even Ezekiel 36, 33, I will also cause you to, he says, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the wastes shall be built. Right, so that's one example. Just want to show you one more example and then we'll finish. This is Ezekiel 37. Whenever you talk about Israel, Zionism, all this end times prophecy, you're always going to talk about Ezekiel 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? And I always thought when people told me about the Valley of the Dry Bones, it's like, wow, like they've got some really clear scriptures to say that God is dealing with Israel and bringing him into the land. And then I read Ezekiel 37, and I, I don't know how they come to that conclusion. Like it's obviously they're putting a meaning into the passage rather than the passage just plainly stating that. And that is the problem with a lot of biblical prophecy is they apply their own meaning to what's going on as opposed to just explaining what it is and explaining it in light of New Testament teaching. Ezekiel 37. This is when Ezekiel goes to the val this valley and there's all these dead corpses there and a miracle happens and God uses that as, an, as, as a lesson. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. So this is why it's called the valley of the dry bones. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So you see how there's still this picture here of them responding to God's word, and that's why they get revived. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe upon these slain, so that they may live. Isn't that, does that not remind you, Oh, he shall gather his elect from the four winds of the earth? So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, this is how the modern-day Israel proponent will take this verse. They will say, you see how he prophesied to the bones, and the bones, they came in stages. It was the sinews, then the muscle, then the skin. And they would say, see, that's God fulfilling prophecy in Israel. He's going to bring them back dead, 
right, the bones. And then as waves of Israel, Israelis and Jews go to Israel, that's like the sinews and the skin. And then one day he's going to breathe the life into them. They're all just going to get saved, right? Because they have that special privilege. But do you see when you actually read the passage... Do you get that? No, you can see that. No, it's their philosophy being put into this passage. If anything, when you read this passage, it is they are becoming alive by responding to God's word. And then it talks about gathering the breath from the four winds. Does that not sound like the rapture, right? When we're resurrected. And look at what he says here. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. I mean, if you know your New Testament, that sounds exactly like the rapture, when we are made alive, and then we're brought into the land of Israel as the true Israel of God. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So I just remember talking about this, and I didn't have a lot of knowledge about this in the past, and thinking, oh man, they've got these, all these prophecies in the Old Testament. And, and then you go and read them, and I'm like, well, that just sounds like the rapture. It doesn't sound like modern day Israel, God bringing them there, and I'm believing all the Israelites going, and then one day they're just going to get saved because they're a descendant of Abraham. But you can see that a lot of Bible prophecy on the internet that you read, and this is why you have to be very careful, you have to go and read the passage yourself and, and use those principles that I teach you to say, hey, interpret stories in light of statements and make sure that the New Testament explains the Old Testament. Because if you don't, you're going to read all these things, you're going to read all these Old Testament passages, somebody's going to give you an interpretation, it's going to contradict the New Testament. So in conclusion, I know this was a, a long sermon, Sorry, probably more information in there than I expected. But just a couple of thoughts in conclusion. One is the Israel and Palestine conflict. This is not some holy war, although it may be to those involved. I believe it's simply a war between two countries that have their own agendas. This has nothing to do with biblical prophecy. Number two, Christians should not blindly support modern-day Israel under the false pretext that they are supporting the will of God. And this is, this is why it becomes such a political issue, because you have a lot of Christians in America that believe modern-day Israel is this fulfillment of prophecy, it's God's people, so that's why they're willing to send foreign aid, American troops to die, and unfortunately, Australian Christians also get caught up in that, and they want to send Australian Christians to die, Australian taxpayer funds in foreign aid, over to a nation that has nothing to do with the will of God. And number three, believers make up the true Israel of God. And the modern day Israel is not the true Israel of the Bible. So a lot of information there. Hopefully uh, you, you learned some things there, what the Bible says about it. Um, and that gives you a more biblical perspective on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word this morning. And Lord, there's just so much, uh, so much misconceptions and, and uh, lies in the world. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, help us to have a right perspective on things. And Lord, we will always look at even things in the world through the, through the lens of the Bible and through the truth of your word. So we thank you, Lord, for giving us your word so we have that guidance and that lamp and light to help us have the right view of what we see in the world. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.